Good evening, everybody. I'm, I think I know most of you, Ruth Smith, and um, I do have the honor of being the adult education chair. Actually, I'm the whole committee, I think, um, <laughs> for this year. Um, would love to have additional help if anyone would like to be on the committee with me. Um, but we're really lucky to have um, our, let's see if I get it right, interim education director, Amy Ripps, available to us adults for education, not just our children. I understand she does an amazing job with the kids, um, but she'll be teaching us um, over a course of multiple Thursdays and it's not every Thursday. So you really do need to look at the list. Um, we're gonna do a walk through the Bible and uh, a journey through the Bible, I think is the, the way it was phrased. But um, I'll go ahead and turn it over to Amy and, and let her get started. Um, you know, this is a small group. So next week or the next time we do this, let's get it double the number. <laughs> Okay, so good evening, everyone. Um, I just want to share a little bit about me. Um, and, uh, and as long as we are a small group, I had two options. And so as long as we are a small group, I may ask you all if you're comfortable chatting just to tell me a little bit about yourselves. But we'll get to that in a second. So I am from New Jersey. I do tend to talk fast. I apologize in advance. If you need me to slow down, just let me know. Um, and I, I was in Jersey uh, until I graduated high school did college in Pittsburgh, wound up in the DC area for 15 years, I think, and then came down to North Carolina in, uh, in the summer of 1992. So I've been here for a while, not a native, um, and we came to Raleigh, it was a job move. Um, and growing up, I did average Hebrew school, I'm not a day school yeshiva student, I did uh, um, normal afternoon Hebrew school, of course it was seven hours a week back then, but still, and I did go to the Ramah, Camp Ramah, I went to the one in Canada, and I was very active in USY, so I was, and being that I lived in Jersey outside of New York, we were sort of like the poster community for United Synagogue, right, we were close to the seminary, many of my, um, my Hebrew high school teachers were from the seminary, and my USY advisors, things of that nature, so I I think I had a really strong background. Um, uh, my uh, parents were sort of your average, I mean, I don't want to say anything bad about them because Diane knows, knew them, uh, but my, my parents were sort of your average suburban Jewish folks. Uh, my father moved to a small town in Jersey and his dad died very soon thereafter and he found himself needing to say Kaddish. And that's how he got involved in the community. By suddenly going to show this young man and the old guys, and it was mostly men, I'm sure it was all men, said, oh, you know, who are you? And, uh, you know, he was the, I think the youngest president of the synagogue. My mother was the first female president of the synagogue. Uh, they were quite active in that community and really pillars of that, of that community. And so that's the world I grew up in. Uh, but I fell into Jewish education as a professional. I uh, did get a, a certification to teach um, from the state of Pennsylvania, but my field was actually quantitative analysis. I'm a math person and I um, wanted to go into educational research, which didn't happen. Um, but uh, when I wound up in D the DC area through a number of interesting happenstances, I was um, asked if I could just sub for a teacher, this is gonna sound familiar, while she went on maternity leave. Um, and she was gonna go out like in, uh, you know, in like, you know, the beginning of May. So it'd just be a few weeks, it was for a friend of mine. So I said, sure. The next day, the beginning of March, the woman delivered early and I was in the classroom. It, not a kind of her, so you're fine, you're fine, Haya. <laughs> And, um, and uh, I loved it, you know, and I, and as it happened, my boss was an Orthodox Jewish guy and I worked out with him and I could change my hours. So the next year I could get off work early to go teach Hebrew school. And by the second year, um, I had gotten married in the interim and was able to afford to quit my full-time job and go into Jewish education. Um, but it was all um, by the seat of my pants, great mentors. But it wasn't really until a few years ago that I actually went back to school and got my master's in Jewish education. Um, my role at Beth Meyer Synagogue, which is where I have been for the last 30 years, I was an active volunteer. We had very few Jewish children. I would teach here and there as needed. And then again, uh, about, 30, about uh, 20 years ago, the board came to me and said, we're not renewing this woman's contract. Well, if she walks in the middle of the year, will you step in just for a few months? And I said, sure, I could do that. So that was a 20 year long step in just for a few months. And as I said, during that time, I got my master's degree and was very involved um, in, in uh, what was used to be called CAGE, which was a Jewish professional organization for educators. Now it's New CAGE. Um, I spent a summer at the conservative yeshiva in Jerusalem studying and I've really just availed myself of whatever I could to learn. 
Um, I thought when I was young that I would teach first graders how to read. That was what I thought my passion was. I have graduated. I much prefer teaching adults at this point in my life. The little ones are cute, but adults are wonderful because you all add to the party. Um, and, uh, um, and I taught in Raleigh. I don't know if you're familiar with the Melton uh, program for adult education, but it's a two year course of study. And I taught for the Melton program for about a dozen years as well. Uh, to adults and just um, love it and take every opportunity I can to share uh, information with adults. So enough about me. Um, if you could, each of you, uh, I'll call your names just so you'll know when it's your turn um, and just unmute and tell me, um, I mean, I can see your name, so that's great, but tell me how long you've been in Wilmington um, and um, where are you from? If you aren't from Wilmington, if you're not a Southerner, you know, wh where did you sort of spend your formative years? And um, if, um, if your Jewish background was like sort of primarily reformed conservative or orthodox, even if that background was only a few days old, right? If you chose Judaism last week, you know, through which avenue did you choose it? Just so I know who I'm chatting with. So, um, Rabbi Bender, do we, can we start with you? So you can set it off and then we'll go around. I can remember the prompts, uh, Rabbi Bender. Oh, I can put it in the chat. I can put it in the chat. <laughs> no, uh, I've been here since, uh, July 1st. It's just a little, well, June 24th, my birthday was uh, when I rolled up. Um, I'm originally from South Jersey, <laughs> Lake Sea, as we say, Atlantic City. Um, where I'm from originally, that's where I'm from originally. And uh, yeah. And, and were you raised within the conservative movement? I was raised, sort of. Yeah, I was raised a, a conservative synagogue um, family that my grandparents were very, very affiliated. My parents were not so much. Then I uh, rebelled and became an ultra Orthodox Jew. And uh, I have, uh, the pendulum has swung back and here I am as a conservative rabbi. So uh, I, <laughs> all, all the movements. <laughs> excellent, excellent. Thank you. Ruth, do you wanna share with us, please? Sure, happy to. Um, born in Brooklyn, raised on Long Island in Stony Brook. Um, was raised um, conservative. My mom was reformed, my dad was Orthodox. So they split the difference and raised my brother and I conservative. Um, I've been in Wilmington full time since, 2015 for five, it'll be six years this summer. Um, but I bought a second home here in 2008 and started spending time here um, then. But I've been coming to Wilmington since the 1980s. My mom and dad were living in Charlotte um, in the, the mid to mid eighties for about, I think 12 years. And um, they left New York, went to Charlotte and they bought a place out here and actually were members of B'nai Israel um, during that time because they would come here on weekends and holidays. So, and they occasionally will clue into to our, our Zoom. So we may see, uh, I think my mom has a sisterhood meeting. They're, they're in Alexandria, Virginia now where I left to come here. Um, but I think, I think we may see dad for a little while. Excellent, thank you. Diane, if you can share with us. My name is Diane Gerberg. I was born and raised in New Jersey. Um, Amy's uh, parents were anything but ordinary. I knew them. They were good friends of mine at a congregation of Good of Israel where uh, we attended in New Jersey. I was a ballet dancer uh, in New York with the Joffrey Ballet. Um, I was raised a Roman Catholic, but 34 years ago, I converted to Judaism and it was the conservative movement. Great, thanks so much. Naomi, can you share a little bit with us? Well, uh, I don't have too much to share. Actually, I've only lived in Wilmington for three months. I'm a brand new member, actually, of B'nai Israel, Tadaraba. <laughs> and uh, let's see, actually, Amy, I think you and I may have some commonalities here. i uh, first generation American, but I uh, was born in Pittsburgh <laughs> and uh, raised in Squirrel Hill which is a uh, orthodox conservative when I grew up. Uh, so that's somewhat of my background. And um, for the most part, um, after graduating college, went to Israel to live and work for about three years, worked for Machzavei Israel, and then came back to the States and worked in DC and actually for Montgomery County. And um, let's see what else. Retired, 
and moved to Virginia on the other side of the Potomac, which many Marylanders rarely do. Uh, and um, then we uh, moved to South Carolina because my husband enjoyed golfing. Unfortunately, he passed away five years ago. And, um, and here I am. I lived in L Laurenburg, which had a population of uh, three Jews. So now they have a population of two Jews, a third of the population left. Um, let's see what else. And here I am in Wilmington because I missed that Jewish uh, connection. So Great. here I am. Great. Well, I mean, I, I feel like I'm not really in a position, but welcome to Wilmington. This is really, this is wonderful to have you. <laughs> and Anita, why don't you share with us? We can hear you, you're, you're, you're fine. Okay. okay. I came here in 1978 with wow. my family. And uh, Wilmington was very different then. I was born and raised in Newark, New Jersey. Many, many Jews went to Weequake High School, which was the Jewish high school, Ooh. and um, kept a kosher home. We were very Jewish, but we did not go. There was no formal education for me. Only the boys went. I was not going because I was a girl. I always felt left out. Anyway, to make it short, married and uh, my husband had open heart surgery in 77. And then I had a part-time job and the boss had a place down in Wilmington. And he said, why don't you see if you like Wilmington? So we went to Wilmington during an ice storm. <laughs> and my husband was born in, in Alabama and he loved it, the beach and everything. So we gave it a try. We had two, two children at the time. And uh, we came here and we went to both the temple and the synagogue and just felt more comfortable in the synagogue. Though it was, all, it was really orthodox, only women were allowed to sit with the men. And then years and years go by and my husband passed away and then I had cancer. And then Rabbi Waxman said, a few women want to get together and have a bat mitzvah. I said, but I don't know anything. And he said, they don't either. And lo and behold, I was, I think I was 57 years old. I had a bat mitzvah. Yeah. And I have just soaked up as much of Judaism as I could because it was denied to me when I was growing up. And I love it and B'nai Israel is my family and it, it's a wonderful place to belong. Great. Well, we're a small group, but a very varied group. And I, I love the, the variety and all that you bring to the table for this. So I'm going to share my screen. Um, Can I ask you one question first? Absolutely. Uh, what synagogue were you affiliated when you were in the D.C. area? So in D.C., I worked at Otis Israel in the district and also Temple Beth Ami out in Rockville. Now it's out in Potomac. With Shara Tafila for about oh. 10 I have a lot of uh, friends that were that worked their chairs to fill it. Absolutely, we can do this later, and I can talk shuls for Pittsburgh also. Okay, so um, let me share my screen now. If you um, look at the top of your, uh, should be the the top of your screen. There should be a place that says view, um, and you can choose. Um, if you click on that, it'll say side by side, and to me, that's the best way to look at a slideshow. Well, you have people in the room because you, you'll have the and you, there's a in between the people and the slideshow. There's like a little faint line. And if you put your mouse on it, you can move it. It's a slider. So you can see more people. You can see more screen, whichever you choose. So you can play around with that. But I should be you should be able to see me um, uh, regardless. At least I hope so. So um, so what is this course? Well, um, it's, it's a survey course, it, it, you know, in nine weeks, you know, what can we do? Um, I actually, at Beth Meyer, we did a, a, a program. I have a group I meet with every Wednesday morning and we did one book of Bible every week. It, it took us quite a long while to get through, but, and even that is a survey because you, you, you can't uh, do the whole of Genesis in one week, for example, but this is just a class outline and I'm happy to, um, email all of you um, 
uh, maybe Ruth, if you can just write down everyone's name in case I forget. Actually, no, maybe I'll take a screenshot and just hold on to it that way. And um, and I can, I'm happy to email you the, the course outline if you'd like or, and or in next week's email from the office, there'll be a little bit more detail so that you'll know what we're doing when. Um, now, what is the Tanakh? And again, I, I don't know enough of your background. So we're starting sort of basic. Um, and and uh, I, I hopefully, if you're, if you're bored, let me know. And if you need me to slow down, let me know. So the word Tanakh is the word that we use for what's typically called the Hebrew Bible. You and I would say it's the Bible. It's our Bible. It's the Bible. But for the outside world, it's known as the Hebrew Bible. And it's referred to in Hebrew as Tanakh. Where does that word come from? If you look over here, even if you don't read Hebrew, the first word is Torah. The second word is Nevi'im, which is, means prophets. And the third word is Ketuvim, which means writings. And you'll notice I made them in red on both sides, the English and the Hebrew. I didn't make this in red, but whatever. And they made an acronym. Now I got to tell you, um, this is something that I don't think I ever knew as a kid, but the more I, I uh, study and research, the more it amazes me. Jews love acronyms. <laughs> Everything is an acronym. Every great sage we have, it seems like, has a nickname, some of them more than one. And, um, and it's, it's, oh, they're all acronyms. And in fact, I, I, I am in, and I'll reference, I'm sure, I'm in a group, um, uh, a Dafyomi group for Talmud. We, we theoretically are reading a page of Talmud every day. Not, we don't all do all the reading, but um, but they the rabbis reference uh, acronyms as a way to remember things, um, and you'll even see it in the Passover Seder in a few short weeks. Um, that after we say the ten plagues, there's like the next page is they say, oh, and the rabbis called it, and they give you these three words, which is none of us know those words, but it's a way to remember the ten plagues. I learned it because I have a cute kid song, but um, so this is this is where the word comes from, and the ah part, tanach, the vowel part, is just a typical way that um, uh, base Hebrew words are are pronounced. So it, it looks like this: these three letters and the little uh, like quotes the. Um, I, don't know, I call it chick chick, but it's a it's a little symbol in Hebrew that shows you that it's an abbreviation. So what's in the Torah? This is what you probably know the best. And um, you'll see that these are the words in English and these are the transliterated words from the Hebrew. Now, the interesting thing with Torah is, at least to me, is that in the Hebrew, the name of the book and actually the name of each of our Parshas every week comes from the first main word. It's not about what the book's about, right? When we, when we look at a book, you look at the title and the title should inform you a little bit what the book is about, but, but not necessarily so. It's the first main word. For example, the book of Exodus, which is, starts with the story of Moses and really is about the Exodus. In Hebrew, we call it Shmot, names. Why? Because it begins with, these are the names of the people that went down to Egypt. So that's the Torah. Then we have the books of the prophets. And... It says 21 books, but it depends on who you ask. Um, you'll notice Samuel and Kings have two books, one and two. Anyone know why they get two? It's a very simple answer. They had a lot to say. <laughs> Basically, yes, the scroll is too long. The scroll was too long, and so they put it onto two scrolls. Don't forget, the Torah is on two poles, right? We open it, two poles. Other scrolls are just on one, like we have the Megillat Esther. It's just one scroll, and, you know, they pull it out, and they, they didn't want to pull so long. So if the scroll is too large, um, uh, they split it up. Uh, so some people consider Samuel, if they're counting, they'll say one book, but it's two books. And again, a book is a scroll. And then down here you'll see the 12 prophets and they're lumped together. In fact, some people, in some places they're called the minor prophets, but again, not because there's anything minor about them. It's the size of the books. These are way, way smaller books than the ones above. And they're referred to, uh, I think it's Aramaic, Treasar, the 12, um, but I do like to give them individuality and like to name them. Um, you will notice perhaps some of my, um, when I write in transliteration, like in down here in Habakkuk, you can see the H has a, a line under it. I think it's a Habakkuk. Well, it's definitely Nachum. And uh, Habakkuk, right? Right? Nahum? Okay. So the line is that guttural H. Okay. So the, the that, we, that we Jews say. 
sometimes uh, we're used to seeing a CH for that, like Hanukkah with the CH. But in fact, um, for Hanukkah, I would put the line and there's another letter that has the guttural and for that you'll see a KH, but it'll become obvious as, as we go along. And then the third section are the writings, the Ketuvim. And of those, you're probably very familiar with Psalms, even if you don't realize it. Um, and a little bit of Proverbs. And of course, the, the Megillah, Megillah to Esther, the Megillah of Esther is the one we just read on Purim. And that's the one that most people know. But there are five of these books called Megillot or Megillah. And each one of them is assigned to a different holiday. Uh, Esther is, of course, Purim. The book of Ruth, we read on Shavuot in the spring, about seven, exactly seven weeks after the beginning of Passover. We'll be reading Song of Songs on Passover. Uh, and um, Ecclesiastes, the book of Kohelet, my favorite, we read on Sukkot. And then Lamentations called Echa, we read on the 9th of Av, a holiday that very few Jews have connection to because it's during the summer, Hebrew school's out of session and it's a fast day and it's sad and it's one day and there's, you know, uh, unless you went to a, a good Jewish summer camp, you don't, you don't know much about Tisha B'Av, the 9th of Av. And then we have uh, books of Daniel, Ezra and Nehemiah, some are historical, some not. And then the last called the Chronicles, which really most Jews don't know anything about. In a lot of ways, the Chronicles are a summary or a retelling of um, some of our history. Um, uh, my, my friend would say, and I, I think she's right, but I have a friend that's sort of militant about this, that it, Chronicles were written to make King David look good. He doesn't actually look so great if you go through the, the, the book, which we'll get to, but um, the Chronicles was rewritten to make him the King David that we all talk, you know, David Melech Israel that we love to talk about. Now, one more thing, and that is that the Torah these terms that we use and that I'll be using interchangeably, I'll always try, I, I do use a lot of Hebrew, but I'll always say the English as well. But Torah is even more confusing because some people call it the five books of Moses, even though um, Moshe is not in the book of Genesis at all. And some people call it the Chumash from the Hebrew term Chamesh, which is five, makes sense, five books, Chamesh, Chumash. And then this last word, which I think people of my age and older certainly know, because most of us grew up in Shul with the Hertz Pentateuch, uh, which is a blue book. It, it's a chumash. It had the five books of Moses in it for synagogue use for Torah readings, but penta meaning five, and tuch, I guess, is some Greek or Latin word that means volumes or books or something, but penta five, chumash five, Five books of Moses. Now, the last complicated thing is that sometimes when we say, oh, I'm studying Torah, they don't mean the Torah. They mean any Jewish knowledge at all, right? Oh, we studied a little Torah today. We read a verse from who knows where and talked about it. Oh, we studied Torah today. It's a Torah, the word does mean uh, learning. It has to do with uh, learning and teaching. Um, so it's not a, a terrible use of the word, but it does tend to complicate folks. Like, what is Torah, right? Is it all of these things? Some people will call the whole of the Bible Torah, but it's not. It's just one third of the Torah. Okay, we will go on. Um, now, a word about the sources that I use. Uh, this is just a nice little cute um, visual for you to see how the books are split up. Um, if you were to hold a, I happen to have one here. If you were to hold a, a, a Tanakh in your hand. It's roughly, but not exactly in thirds, uh, the three parts. The, the, the books of the prophets are larger, but not as large as it looks like in this graph. Um, but I, t I like to use Jewish sources, but even saying that, I'm a little picky about my Jewish sources. Um, I, I have my own biases uh, amongst our uh, the, the, the scope and the, the, the spread of Judaism. And so I, I'm very careful about what sources I use. I occasionally will use Wikipedia and on occasion we'll use Christian sources, even Messianic Christian sources, because I got to tell you, they've got the greatest stuff out there visually. They do an amazing job when I'm putting together things for Sunday school kids, e even for adults and I'm looking for videos, whatever. I really feel hampered because I don't want to be using that material. I don't think it's necessary. I have to be very careful about the representation because, you know, you can have a six minute video and then in the last 30 seconds, they, they put in a reference to Jesus. And it's like, no, I don't, you know, that that's not what the Passover story is about. Um, but, but as I said, graphically, like when I went to look for a, a graphic like this, um, this was like the best I found. Now the, the Melton folks that do adult ed, um, 
uh, do great graphics. They paid a lot of money for it and they don't want us using it unless we're teaching Melton. So I'm very respectful of their, of their copyrights and I try not to use it. Okay, so now who wrote the Bible and when and where does it come from? Now, for many people, that term who wrote the Bible is almost a trigger uh, to a reference that I'll speak about later, a book by uh, Richard Elliott Friedman, who's down in, uh, in Georgia. Um, he's a professor, I'm pretty sure, at the University of Georgia, although he lives in Atlanta, I'm pretty sure. But, um, but that's not what we're talking about. His book, Who Wrote the Bible, goes into a, 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 a science of literary criticism, biblical criticism, that is fascinating, and I think it's right on the money, but that's not what we're discussing. We're looking at where did it come from? So when I, whenever I have these italicized texts, I do like to have, um, I don't like to just hear my own voice, but I also don't like to put people on the spot. So is there anybody that enjoys reading English out loud that would unmute and like to read the English? Oh, Diane, please, please just go ahead. Okay. Who wrote the Bible and when? The Torah texts say that we read today, I'm sorry, the Torah texts that we read today are believed by some to be the same as those given to Moses and the people of Israel by God. It is believed by scholars that the word of God and history of the Jewish people was imprinted on the minds of the Israelites at Mount Sinai. Over the years, as tradition was orally passed on and eventually written down, many disparities of the Torah emerged as countless scribes wrote numerous scrolls. So I'm not here to tell you definitively that the Torah doesn't come or the Bible doesn't come from Mount Sinai. It's not the way I look at it, but who knows? We weren't there. We don't know, right? And so this is a faith issue. And um, certainly there are Jews that believe absolutely the entirety of the Torah and all Jewish knowledge was given to Moshe at Mount Sinai and it revealed over time and it's still being revealed. Now, I, as a kid used to think, well, how could that be then? Like Moses could have just like, he could have just read ahead. Like, you know, he, he just could have, he just could have read to the end of the book. You know, like, well, I, I didn't understand. What do you mean it was all given to him at that moment? Of course, it's a little bit more complicated that even, even the, those that believe that have a much more sophisticated view of what it means that the, that the knowledge was given at Mount Sinai. But we are going to look at um, uh, more of the practical and the human interaction with the, with the text. So, so if it didn't come from God, or even if it was divinely inspired, but wasn't written down by Moshe at that moment, then, so where is it from? Okay, do I have another volunteer reader? Anybody comfortable? I'm happy to read, but I'm, oh yeah, Anita, please go ahead. Canonization, and if not from God or not wholly from God, then canonization broadly construed as the process through which the Bible became the Bible is only vaguely understood. We do not know exactly how various books were chosen to be part of the Bible to the exclusion of others how these books were put into a particular order and how their text was established. Since there are no contemporaneous documents that describe this process, it needs to be reconstructed from indirect evidence, namely from the variety of biblical texts from different periods and places that have survived and from later traditions in rabbinic and other sources that discuss canonization. Right, and this is a quote from a fabulous book. If this is a subject that interests you, the Jewish Study Bible by Adele Berlin and Mark Steve Brettler is just brilliant. Um, uh, Dr. Brettler actually is now at Duke. He used to be um, up at Brandeis. He's at Duke half the year and in Israel half the year. Uh, we've had him speak at, uh, at Beth Meyer, but it's just, it's a brilliant, brilliant book. But we don't, the answer is we don't know. It's like such a frustrating thing for us. We don't know. I, I studied uh, several times with a, a young man named Joel Hoffman, who's a bit of a eccentric, intriguing educator and uh, son of a great rabbi. And he used to do a class on God's name, right? Like we don't know God's name. There are four letters. We don't say it. It's the tetragrammaton. We don't write it down. We don't throw it out. When we see it, we, we teach the kids, look at those letters and say something else, right? And he, he gave, it never occurred to me, he gave this, uh, this she or this lesson, he said, we Jews, we forget like nothing. What do you mean we forgot God's name? 
That's like, that's not a satisfying answer. What do you mean we forgot how to say God's name? That's craziness, right? So it, 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 you have to wonder, how is that not recorded? How did this come together? And yet it's not recorded and we don't know. And it's a, it's a continuing, continually unraveling mystery. And every time they dig up another artifact, they put another piece into the puzzle. So the, the text that we use, you and I use, is called the Masoretic text. And the, um, the, it, it's traditionally held to be the correct text of the Bible established by this group of scholars, the Masoretes. I don't know why it's spelled like this. I've always pronounced it Masoretes. This looks like Masoretes to me, but I say Masoretes. Um, and they were pretty much from the 6th to the 10th century. So it's not even like one, you know, we're talking over hundreds of years. And they examined many biblical manuscripts that existed at the time. And they then said, okay, guys, we've looked at all the options and we've put this together and this is your text from now on. Now, the Masoretes, the name comes from the word Masora, which means uh, tradition. Um, uh, some of you may know that the conservative movement is called Masora T, right? That's fat word from tradition. And they wanted to, up to, to maintain the, the uh, traditions of the Jewish people. They also are the ones, as I understand it, that added um, the trope to the text and maybe even developed the vowel system that we use um, because they were worried that, that we were losing knowledge, right? And this happens all the time, by the way. And you may know that um, like the Talmud, for example, is always known as the oral tradition. Well, why is it the oral tradition if it's written down? Well, this guy, Judah Hanasi, around the year 200 said, you know what, guys, we're forgetting. We have to write this down. So even though it's now written, it's still considered to be the oral tradition. Um, uh, okay, and by the way, some of these references, I do have a reference sheet again, which I'm happy to email you, but um, uh, jewishvirtuallibrary.org is um, not as professional as some I like, but it's a good resource. And the other one is myjewishlearning.com. Uh, they're, they're both my go-tos. Um, uh, you know, to, to begin. At myjewishlearning.com, you often find things on a very elementary level, which is a great place to start, and then you can dig deeper. Because there is also um, uh, an old version of the Jewish Encyclopedia online for free, but those articles are major scholarly and long and small print, and it's good to start simple. Um, so what texts were they looking at? And are there other texts still? Well, the answer is yes, there are other biblical texts. And the, what the notes I'm going to put up here now is from another one of my favorite websites called the Torah.com. The Torah.com is a fabulous website, actually. It's an interesting group of people who are themselves by self-definition observant Jews, whatever that means. They're scholars. And, um, and they, they submit articles and it's, uh, they have Parshat Shavua, the portion of the week, but they also have general articles. And he has a series of essays uh, about uh, the, the Bible. So we have in existence something called the Samaritan Pentateuch. Now the Samaritans are a really interesting group of people that still exist today in Israel and a few other places in the world. They're not actually Jews. Uh, they may have been Jews. It's a lot of shrouded in history. Uh, they only have the text of the Torah, which they do, by the way, use uh, if it's from about the second century. But because they don't identify as Jews, we don't consider it a Jewish text, even though scholars will look to it when they're comparing things. We also have something that you may have heard of called the Septuagint, or when you don't want to write out that whole word, it's just the LXX, which means 70. Septa, of course, septum meaning seven from the Latin. And it was a Greek translation of the Hebrew, and it's got a legendary story of its development. We were all told as kids, oh, it's so cool. They took 70 scholars in Alexandria, Egypt, where they were speaking Greek, by the way, and they put them in 70 different rooms, and they, they had to translate the Torah into Greek, and they all did it exactly the same. Okay, so that's just fable. It's like lovely, I bought it as a kid. It was very disappointing when I found out as an adult that that's just, it's just not true. Um, but uh, there is a, 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 a text that came from that episode called the Septuagint. And um, it seems because of certain differences in the text, it seems as though it was based on slightly different original Hebrew texts 
than our own Masoretic text is. One of the things I really love about some of the articles in the Torah.com is they'll sometimes take a, a part of the Torah and show you um, the stories from the different biblical sources and how they, what's missing and what's added and who knows what came first and what is, you know, it, it's fascinating. Um, it's if you like detective work. Um, we also have something called the Vulgate, which is a Latin translation of the Bible and the Peshitta, which is less common, the Assyriac translation. These were never thought to be Jewish texts, unlike the Septuagint, which had a relationship to the Jewish community in Alexandria. In fact, they used to use, the, there's evidence that they used it. Um, like when, when um, you know, if our rabbis quote from the Torah and they, they then read it to you in English, there's evidence that in, in Alexandria, Egypt, in the Greek Jewish communities, that, that the Septuagint in Greek was what they used. Um, so, um, so then some people will always say, well, but now we have the Dead Sea Scrolls. Don't we know for sure uh, what, what the text is? Well, no, we don't. Um, uh, the Dead Sea Scrolls, you probably all know the story, uh, uh, discovered um, seratithously, ser incidentally in, in caves in Quran. I don't know if anybody's even been there. It's fascinating to look at them a little bit. You have to wonder, how did those shepherd boys get into those caves? Like, they, these were not easy caves to get to. But um, uh, they don't answer the question. Uh, we have pieces of every book of the Bible represented in the Dead Sea Scrolls, except for the Book of Esther. But none of them are complete. Uh, if you've been to the, um, the the shrine of the book at the Hebrew um, at the Israel Museum in Jerusalem, you you've seen that beautiful. I think it's an Isaiah scroll, magnificent in the middle. So you go round and round and look at it, and it's very cool, and you can recognize passages. But it it doesn't answer for us. Is the Masoretic text the real one? Does it match completely? It it just doesn't help us. Um, I know that uh, the art museum at um, in Raleigh has had a, a Dead Sea Scrolls exhibit in the past. I don't know if any of you were able to attend in other cities, but it is a fascinating, fascinating uh, bit of intrigue. The book, um, um, uh, the, a, a lot of intrigue with uh, uh, scholarly espionage almost. Um, you know, uh, I'm a scholar and I've got access to these books and I'm not gonna let anybody else see them because I'm gonna publish first or whatever. We have the same thing that happened with Solomon Schechter and the Cairo Geniza. The whole level uh, in academia, it's something I don't know much about, but it's sort of intriguing. It's not like, oh, I'll share with you. They're not so friendly always. Um, but you can uh, access a lot of the Dead Sea Scrolls online now. And it's, if you're interested in that kind of history, it's definitely worth doing. Um, so from the rabbinic period, loosely up until, I don't know, like four or 600 or so um, uh, um, CE. Oh, I'll share with you. So I do use the terms BCE for the negative numbers, like before zero, which, and of course, zero never existed. Nobody woke up and said, oh, happy new year at zero. Like that doesn't exist. And, um, and, and then the, the positive numbers, as I say, as a mathematician are CE, common era, or before Common Era, but I'll share with you. I don't know if you saw in Purim, they had a comedian telling of this story. It was a, a, a uh, was some kind of benefit for a group in New York, uh, you know, people suffering under COVID. And I didn't really enjoy it. I'm too old. I, I, they were young comedians. It, was, it wasn't for me, but the host, whoever he was, I'd never heard of him before. He, he, he gave a great explanation of BCE. He, he said this, he said, BCE is, you know, that's what you say because Christ, eh, so I sort of enjoyed that a little bit. So BCE, because Christ, eh. Okay, um, I, I don't mean any insult, but you know, whatever. I have to have fun with it. Um, now, you may not have noticed, but in that list that I had up in the beginning with the Tanakh, Maccabees aren't there, guys, right? Favorite Hanukkah story, why aren't they there? Well, it leads me, right, where they go? Leads me to the discussion of the Apocrypha. Uh, which uh, the definition is legendary or mythical. These are other um, scrolls of the similar era to much of what's in the Tanakh. And for whatever reason, they didn't make the cut. And they were, but they were, they were kept, but they weren't put in our Bible. Uh, some of the ones, um, uh, oh, and it, so someone read where you this little quote, I think it's from Tulishkin's book on literacy. Uh, Ruth, you want to give a read? I saw your hand moving. You want to give a read? Oops, you're muted though. I thought I thought I saw you unmuting. Uh, right. Hang on one sec. I just need to move you guys because you're. I put you at the top. Oh, of we're it. missing the yeah, yeah. yeah. 
I'm missing the top. Hey, where is the story of the Maccabees? The apo apocrypha. Apocrypha. Uh, definition, legendary or mythical. When the rabbis designated the biblical canon, they excluded all works that they believed were written after the age of Ezra, the great fifth century BCE sage. What unifies the books in the Apocrypha, right. therefore, is that they are all post Ezra. And, and Ezra was uh, the, uh, after the first destruction, the destruction of the first temple in 586 BCE. Um, about 50 years later, Cyrus, who's now ruler of what was Babylonia, is now Persia, um, allows the Jews to go back and rebuild the temple. It's not such a fast process, but Ezra is one that goes back uh, uh, with them. And so we're talking about uh, 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 like the early 500s BCE. Um, and they say that, oh, all works that were written after that are excluded. So then you like said, what about Esther? Is Esther really before Ezra? Is Esther after Ezra? A lot of mysteries on this one. Um, some of the famous or well-known books of the Apocrypha include the books, and notice it says books of the Maccabees, because some say there are two, some say there are four. Um, uh, something called Ben Sira, which people are, uh, there's a lot more interest in Ben Sira lately and the wisdom of Ben Sira. The, the book of Judith and Tobit, maybe you've heard of them, maybe not, but there are plenty more. Now, just to make it even more complicated, um, uh, the, some of the apocryphal books are actually included in Christian Bibles, even though they're like sort of our books, but we, and we didn't include them, but some Christian denominations did. And and this one I have to write down at the bottom. There's also a separate collection of works called the Pseudepigrapha, um, which is an, another whole genre we're not gonna touch at all, but it, it's out there. And so when we talk about the Bible, it's a way more complicated and, and detailed and varied subject than we, than, we, uh, than we think there might be. Okay, so just to take a look at uh, a chart that I like, it might make you glaze over, especially if it's small. But and, and I think this is, by the way, from a Hebrew, uh, from a Christian site, and it might be a Messianic Christian. Not everybody's so upfront, and like when they put about us, you know, and you try to figure out who they are, they're not always so for you know telling you this. But but I but but he gets it right, it seems. So this this is the our Tanakh, and uh, he calls Torah law, and then the books of the prophets. And then the writings, although I, there's a little five next to Psalms, and I don't know why, unless maybe some people think the Psalms are in five divisions. I, 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 that might be a typo. I don't know why it's there. But if you were to look at this closely, you'll see that everybody agrees what's in the five books of Moses. Right there. This is, these are the old ones, the Septuagint, the Vulgate, but Catholic Bibles and Lutheran Bibles and English Bibles and most worldwide Bibles. But once we get to the prophets, it changes. And you'll notice that they all have Ruth up under the books of Judges. Um, I think largely because Ruth historically is um, uh, around, is, a, is a, a, like a great grandmother to King David. So she, in, in historical order, she should be there. And they move- I had a lot of judges in my family, if that's helpful. <laughs> that's, uh, uh, and then they, they, they include uh, Judith and, and Tobit and some of the other apocryphal works right into uh, the main canon of what they would call the Old Testament. You'll notice they group them by historical books, um, wisdom literature, and prophets. Uh, we, we don't separate that out. Um, so so it's, there, there are a lot of variations, and it's always intriguing when you're talking to someone of another faith to make sure you both know what you're talking about. I was once at an interfaith uh, grouping, and it was a discussion of Abraham. It was a great program we did here in Raleigh many years ago. And we were talking about the binding of Isaac, uh, the, 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 the sacrificing of Isaac, the binding of Isaac. And, but we didn't call it that. We, we kept referring to it as when Abraham went up to sacrifice his son. And I'm at a table with a Muslim and boy, I cannot for the life of me figure out what this guy is talking about. And he keeps like questioning me and I keep questioning him. It turns out, I didn't know this, but in Islam, they believe that the binding was the binding of Ishmael that Abraham went to sacrifice his first son, Ishmael, not mm. Isaac, his second son. So we were talking about the same story, but we were missing each other. So you always need, if you have uh, non-Jewish friends that go to Bible groups and they talk to you about Bible, you always need to find, first establish that you're on the same page, literally. Okay, a word about in, in, in translation. Translations are interpretations. There's no other way I can make that more plain to you. 
whenever you translate something from any language to another language, it is, you are you're interpreting that language. Um, in fact, if you think of it, the, the people that sign and they'll be like, they'll do sign language, ASL uh, for a speech, they're called interpreters, right? They're, they're not called translators because there's really no such thing as a translation directly because our language is developed differently. Now, I would say to you that for me, there's nothing better than the King James version of the Bible. That English is just magnificent. And I still miss hearing the 23rd Psalm in that language. When we do it here in Raleigh, we use the, uh, I'll talk about the other translations, we use the new JPS. And it's, it's a nice translation. It's probably more accurate to the Hebrew, but the poetry of the King James version is astounding. And that comes from about the 1600s. Anyway, let's, let me look at some of the translations with you. Our translations, the, the main ones that you would come in contact with uh, are from what's called the Jewish Publication Society. The first one that was done in 1917 and the one that we use today that's in the Chumash, probably I think you guys use Eitz Chaim at, uh, at, in Wilmington, use Eitz Chaim Chumash, I'm assuming. Yeah, uh, that's all the 1985 translation. There've been some uh, um, amendments to it, um, but that's what we use. And two organizations where I can find that online and, and uh, I think they're great resources, mechonmamre.org has the old translation, which is um, for many years has been fully available, uh, you know, free of charge, no copyrights, whatever, you can just grab the English, but it's got the these and the thous and the doists and the whatever. And then Safaria, which apparently has the new JPS, um, I've, I've been sort of pirating um, the new JPS from um, the, just the Torah from, um, from um, uh, the Jewish Theological Seminary. When they list their different Torah, um, there's a link to the JPS translation. So I used to just sort of you know, steal from that rather than retype it all. But now with Safaria, you can just easily get to it. Um, some of the newer translations though, beyond these, we have Everett Fox, who is a professor up at Clark University. Um, he's a great guy, he's, uh, probably, I don't know, maybe five years older than I, maybe a little bit more. And he is a student of um, Buber and, um, and um, uh, the other guy, um, his name just flew out of my head, but he, uh, of the German translators, he wanted to keep the language, the rhythm of the language. He wanted it auditorially, audit, you know, for you to hear it the same as you would hear the Hebrew. And so sometimes he uses very weird words. He's also done a, a translation of what's called the early prophets, Joshua, Judges, Samuel, and Kings. He's, I think he's still working on more, but I, you know, it's, it's a long time in coming. He's a very sweet man. Um, and then more recently, Robert Alter, who's out on the West Coast, um, as I said, Fox is up at Clark University, Massachusetts, they, they live in Newton, and Robert Alter is out in California, and he published um, a three volume set of the entire Tanakh, and it was all the rage when it came out, I know our library bought it instantly, by the way, it's on sale on Amazon right now, almost half price, so if, if you, something you want to own at your house, I definitely, yeah, go, go look it up, it was, I think it's probably 140, and I think it's on sale for yeah, I think it's about half price, like 70. So it, was, it, was, it looked like it'd be a good deal to me. Um, and what's really important when you translate things is that it, when you looked, because you and I speak English, I'm not fluent in Hebrew. I know some Hebrew terms, but I'm limited by the English. And so when something's confusing, don't just think that, oh, I have to use this English. Look it up in a few different places. Because the classic example, not Judaically, but the classic example for me is the issue of the virgin birth within Christianity. The word that's used in Hebrew to describe Mary is the same word that's used even by the Christian Bible elsewhere, just to say a young lady, not necessarily a virgin, right? A young woman. Now, there's a, you could argue that a young woman by definition is a virgin, whatever, whatever, but still th th there's a huge differences and things that we've misunderstood for centuries because of translations. Okay, we move on. Oh, the final one I wanna to talk to you about just to mention, you should know that this exists. The Anchor Bible Project, I was exposed to it in graduate school. It is brilliant. Um, it's a scholarly work and, and commercial venture began in the 1950s. Over a thousand scholars from all different religions have been part of this project. They continue to work on it. Um, it it's, it's grounded in scholarship and analysis and science and, um, uh, it's, um, it's right, they bring science and whatever, and 
as of 2005, more than 120 volumes of this thing has been published. And in 2007, Yale University Press purchased the series and they still publish backlisted titles as well as new titles under the Anchor Yale Bible series. So if you're ever involved um, in an academic sense uh, in studying the Bible, you will probably be exposed to the Anchor Bible. It's really just brilliant. Okay, um, and then, oh good, I'm good on timing. Okay, and then um, I wanted to share some resources with you that if, if um, anything that we do over the next nine sessions piques your interest, some of my favorite go-tos, um, How to Read the Bible by James Kugel is amazing. And uh, I think he was at Harvard maybe, I don't know, somewhere up there. But, you know, James Kugel, I mean, kind of, kind of a, to me, that was like a joke name to be named Kugel, you know? And then the next thing I hear is my family, part of my family comes from Izmir, Turkey. And my grandfather came to this country, but most of his siblings went to Israel. And I have uh, Turkish cousins in Israel. And I love to go to shul with them uh, when I'm there on Shabbat morning. They go to an old synagogue in an old uh, part of uh, Jerusalem, an old church, Turkish synagogue. And all of a sudden I hear that James Kugel is their rabbi. And I'm thinking, What? Well, it turns out he's from a Turkish family and his original name is something close, not so close, and somehow it got to Kugel that he uses in the States. He doesn't always use it in Israel. Um, unfortunately, the drash he gave was in Hebrew, so I missed most of it, but he's brilliant. Um, what's in the Bible? Now, this is a, a sweet little book that I picked up, I don't even know where, just a little bitty book, little, it's like thin, little bitty book. And it's literally like, um, I don't know, like a... The Least You Should Know, Cliff Notes on each book of the Bible. Uh, it's a really nice little, uh, I, you know, I keep it as a resource. Again, the, the first thing I'll go to is look, well, what did she pick out? And then I'll go deeper. Who Wrote the Bible I mentioned earlier by Richard Elliott Friedman. Um, really a brilliant uh, piece, the, really the first Jewish piece on um, the, what's called the documentary hypothesis about um, that the Bible based on its literary styles, um, seem to have at least four different uh, schools of authors. Um, and by the way, the whole process is literary analysis of the Bible was actually started by a non-Jewish German, I think, maybe in the 1800s, I'm not exactly sure. Uh, and it was done to, um, to discredit the Bible. And it was absolutely ignored by Judaism for a very long time. And it has now been embraced by all of the modern movements within Judaism. The idea that you can say, oh, well, this part is from this era. And this part seems to have been written by this era or this school of thought. Um, the Bible on, uh, I'm sorry, the Jewish study Bible, which I mentioned earlier by Adele Berlin and Mark Svee Brettler. The Bible on Earth is the best read I think I did in all of graduate school by Israel Finkelstein and Neil Asher Silverman. It's great, it's archeology, span it's written simply, it's very readable. Uh, it's a brilliant, brilliant book. And then finally, and unfortunately this woman died at a, at a way too young age, Tikva Frymerkensky wrote, among other things, The Women of the Bible, which it, to me was also just brilliant writing and so insightful um, that I, I like to include it in, in all of my resources. Of course, you know, our, our voice isn't heard loudly in these texts unless we go looking for it and i can you know we're, we're a group of women here but it's important not only for women to look for it but for men as well that clearly women have always been part of the landscape of humanity uh it's just that we have to dig a little bit deeper to hear their voices um and i think that's where we oh yes and then of course just myjewishlearning.com jewishvirtuallibrary.org and the torah.com are, are my favorites but i think that's it for tonight we're supposed to meet again next week um, the night before my, my baby turns 30. It's a big one. And uh, we'll be discussing, uh, we'll be discussing um, the, the Torah, all of the Torah, five books of the Torah uh, at that time. So it's just about at the hour. Any quick questions? <laughs> a lot of information. I have a couple questions. Sure. The use of the word canonization, I always associate it with uh, Christ you know, the Christian writings. And the second question is, you talked about the Samaritra train? The, the uh, Samarians, yeah. The Samarians. Samarians. And you, uh, you said that uh, they are still in Israel, and I wondered how they celebrate if they are a... Uh, you so know. the Samarians, right. The Samar Samaria, if you can picture a map of Israel, I didn't uh, have one prepared. No, it's it, it, over it, there. It, you picture the West Bank. Oh, exactly. You, you've lived in Israel, you know. So you and I, most of us in America call it the West Bank. Israelis, right. it's Judea and Samaria. 
and right. the, sort of the remnants of the two kingdoms of Israel. In fact, I remember when my daughter was living in Israel for a year and the program ended, she was a madricha, she was a, like a, a counselor in the program. And the program ended and she was saying, she was staying for a while and she was going with her co-counselor, an Israeli young man, and they were gonna go to Judea and Samaria. And I said, you mean the West Bank? <laughs> and she said, well, you know, uh, he, he, has, he has a gun, he knows how to shoot. Well, thankfully his parents said you can't go. So <laughs> I, I was not willing for them just to tool around. If they want to go on a program, if they want to go and meet friends, that's one thing. But you don't just go tooling around, not in those years. I mean, every thank God there are times when you can, but not then. Um, so, uh, so the Samaritans, uh, like you might know the term, the good Samaritan laws, right. uh, because there's a, a story in the, in the Christian Bible that talks about somebody that needed help and everyone ignored that person and only a Samaritan from Samaria, so man from Samaria stopped to help the person. So we have this concept of the good Samaritan. But they, they, there's thought that either, well, several thoughts. One is that in 722 um, BCE, before the destruction of the first temple, the Northern kingdom was conquered and uh, the way you conquer people is you would carry them off. You would, you would displace them and you'd put other people in their stead, right? So like if, 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 if Cuomo was coming to conquer Wilmington, he'd take you all and he'd relocate you to Richmond and he'd put maybe people from Raleigh and Wilmington, right? So they, they did this in order to help, um, 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 you know, the people blend in and right and, and take down their, reefs, their defenses. So it's possible that the Sumerians come from some of those relocated people that went into uh, the Northern Kingdom of Israel. It's also possible that they're remnants from what we today call the 10 lost tribes, because we don't know what happened to those Jews in 722, that they actually were Jews that remained there, but interacted with the local populace and sort of became lost to normative Judaism and developed their own thing. But the truth is we don't know. They don't consider themselves Jews or Arab, um, and they have their own religion, much like the Druze population does as well. Oh, thank you very much. You, oh, yeah, I, I love that. Is that the one about the group in Pittsburgh? Or is that, oh, is that the one? To, is that local? They're in Israel, where they do the Passover sacrifice still. Um, that's Absolutely. Very easy, really. wow. there's a, yeah, there's a guy in Pittsburgh that I, I had an article for another My group. A guy in Pittsburgh that, that brought a group of Samaritans into, Samaritans into Pittsburgh to, as like a, you know, scholars and residents to talk about it. They have a Torah, um, and they keep only the Torah holidays. So they have no Talmud, no Hanukkah, no Purim, uh, no, um, no Tubishvat, no, you know, any of that. Um, but the three harvest festivals, and don't forget, we didn't invent the harvest guys. Like everybody had harvest festivals. We just called them what we called them. And we gave them sort of a Jewish association. But if you look in the Torah, a lot of the religious significance of these holidays, Passover, uh, Shavuot and Sukkot, the rabbis put in afterwards. They were just harvest holidays. Um, his, and they were historical a little bit. So th that was the, so that's them. They celebrate that. But you also used, mentioned the word canonization. And yeah, it's because we, we first of all, we're a minority and we tend to hear about these things from the larger Christian community. But the use of the word that is it in the canon, it just means, is it in the body of work, right? Mm -hmm. And so it, it's in a scholarly way, it's us as well. It's, a, it's not loaded as a religious question. It's just that we hear about it more from the majority population. Okay, thank Any, you. Yeah, you're welcome. Any other questions? I, I do talk a lot. I don't have a question, but I wanted to show you, share something with you guys. Um, as we started the class, I went to my little bookshelf back here and pulled out my whole, holy scriptures. This was my bat mitzvah gift from the system of the shul. So nice. I'm not sure I've opened it more than once or twice since then. But right, and that's a JPS version. JPS is if you if you Google the JPS uh, translation of the Torah or the Bible, they, they have all different covers. Like the one I have here is the navy blue one in all English. There's also a, a brown leather one that's Hebrew English with very small print, and uh, and then there's a, a bright blue covered one. And you know, so there's all different versions um, that they've come out with. Really, and there are others. There, there's the Jerusalem Bible, which is a different publishing. There's Koran. There's so there are others, but this is JPS. What I'm really concerned about is that I have five um, membership cards for the North Shore Jewish Center Youth Activities Department with people's names saying that they are members in good standing from September 1st, 1974 to August 31st, 1975. And my name is on it as the treasurer, which is really frightening. <laughs> You know, USY is celebrating its 70th uh, year this year. You could send it into the New York office. They, they'll, oh, they'll, we need to go find these people already? Yeah, <laughs> who knows? 
So does any other comments, questions? Are so you going to uh, are you going to be providing us with some hard copy of anything? Or so that's a really good question. So um, I, I sort of defer to you guys. I can certainly um, uh, make hard copy of what was presented in the slides because I have it in my notes, and I can email it out to you. I can put it in a shared doc that you can access. I, I you know, you tell me what's what will be good for you to have. Or for me personally, I don't have a printer, so I need a hard copy. That's can, me personally. I can print it for you, Naomi. That's fine. So I don't I'll know if I, if I send it maybe into the synagogue office. Maybe they could print it up and either mail it to you or make it available for you to pick up. Is that workable? Is that just something I can ask? If someone puts my name on, I'd be more than happy to, to pick my copy up. Okay, so yeah. I'll talk with Ruth about it. Yeah. Maybe the whole Megillah is over, if you'll pardon the pun. <laughs>